When people die, it's up to the rest of us who are still here to tell their life stories. On September 11th, 2001, 3,000 people died on the same morning in the largest single act of violence to occur in the United States for more than a century. The grief we experienced as a nation is still reverberating through the world 20 years later. We're going to look at some of what that actually means today in this episode of Immortalized. Welcome back to Immortalized, brought to you by Legacy.com. Each episode, we explore the different ways people remember and honor the lives of those who've died. I'm Steven Siegel, and my co-host is Legacy's news editor, Linnea Crowther. Hello. Linnea, in the five years you and I have worked together, we've talked about September 11th a number of times, any number of times, but we've never really just sat down together and remembered what it was like to spend the days and weeks that followed September 11th trying to do work that would help people process what had happened. No, you're right. I don't think we have. You were already working at Legacy in 2001. You were a young writer, new to the world of publishing obituaries. What do you remember about those days? Uh, yeah, I had been at Legacy for a little bit over a year at that time, and and I was young, and so was Legacy. Uh, you know, we were kind of still trying to find our place uh, in the world and and figure out exactly how we were going to make this thing work of placing obituaries online. And then and then nine eleven happened, and it it didn't immediately crystallize for us that like this is this is our mission, but it was obvious that there was work that needed to be done to memorialize these almost 3,000 people who had died, and that we were uh, probably better placed to do that work than almost anyone else out there. We, we, were, we were already thinking about how best to remember people who had died, uh, you know, in an internet kind of way. And now here are many people all at once who need to be remembered. And, and, and publicly, there were so many people who were so devastated whether they knew someone who had died or not and wanted to learn about those lives and wanted to share their condolences and their thoughts and talk about what the day meant. But it took a while for us to to get there. You know, the the week of the attack, I think that in my department anyway, where where you know, I was in the the, the editorial department and you know, we were the ones who who would have done this like, you know, down on the ground work of of putting memorials online and uh, and reviewing the condolences that people submit and all that, uh, you know, we hadn't, we weren't the ones making decisions. We didn't really have anything to do that week except kind of wonder what, what we could do to help. Uh, but then we formed a partnership with the New York Times and the, the New York Times was publishing in their print newspaper short remembrances of each person who had died you know, maybe it was a paragraph or two, some were a little bit longer, but it was a, a pretty extraordinary series that went on for months and months. It took that long. You know, they did a, a, a couple few each day and took a long time to get through all those people. And they wanted to get those online. And we had already been partnering with them in our just, you know, in the day to day obituaries. We had been placing their obituaries online with guest books. So they came to us and asked if we could do that same thing only in in a more special way with these tributes to the people who died on 9/11. It's so weird to look back and recall that at that time in 2001 the internet as we know it was still fairly new to most people. We were still calling it the world wide web every day. Mm -hmm. There was no social media Newspapers were still figuring out how to even do things online, you know, how to report and publish news in a meaningful way online. And with the New York Times deciding that that Portraits of Grief series, which they ended up winning a Pulitzer Prize for, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly, mm -hmm. when they decided that that needed to have a, a big online component as an important part of the mission, and they reached out, you know, to Legacy to actually create the guest books that went with all of those personal tributes. 
that was that was a big deal. It was kind of a, a, a new thing. What, in terms of the work you were doing, what was actually involved in making that process happen? Well, there are parts of this that that I can't really even speak to because, you know, there's tech stuff. There was a lot of techy stuff that needed to get done to make this happen. And I, I have no idea what that was, except that our very small and scrappy tech team, like, worked wonders to make this site happen. But, you know, over over on my end of things, on the editorial team, it took months, you know, as I said, it took months for the New York Times to publish all those tributes in the Portraits of Grief series. And and then, you know, on, on the same track, it took months for us to get all of those online. But, you know, one of the things that I did every day, we, once we kind of settled into our routine, one of the things I did every day when I got in in the morning was check to see what new tributes had been published, both in the New York Times and uh, in some other papers. The Boston Globe was doing some, I think the, I think the Washington Post was, but there were other sources that we had agreements with that we would use their content and, and place it on legacy.com so that it could it could have an online home. So I would check and see who is new to this series online and then get that information over onto our site uh, and you know get it published online and connect it to a guest book then where people could add their thoughts and condolences and and for those who who came in there knowing someone who had died their memories of that person which which happened a lot but then another big thing of course that legacy does is, is reviewing those guest book entries that that people submit that anybody can can get on our site and submit a guest book entry but they do go through human review just to make sure that you know what has been said is appropriate and there's nothing you know copyrighted that would present a legal problem and for my also small and scrappy team, that became just a consuming project was reviewing those guest book entries because this site with the guest books for each of the individual victims, as well as the National Book of Remembrance, that was kind of a, a group guest book. If you didn't want to say something on an individual's, you could say something, you know, for everybody on the National Book of Remembrance. That work of reviewing all of the entries that were submitted to those was just huge. There were many months that in that first year and a little beyond where, you know, we were working 12 hour days and we would, you know, do our work at the office and then say, okay, I got to go home and, you know, walk the dog or feed the cat and then get back online at home and work some more because there was just so much to do. And we were a small team and we had to get it done. It was hard work you know, not the same kind of hard work as, as, you know, you might listen. It wasn't like it was physical work. We were sitting in our chairs doing it, but it was, it was emotionally hard work. No, absolutely. You were literally processing the grief of the whole country every day. Yeah. I have to imagine that was something that had a, you know, an impact on the way you were experiencing life. It absolutely did. And it, it, it's probably hard for me to even say exactly how, although I can give you one example, which was almost everybody I knew at that time was really glued to the news for a long time. And, you know, the, then there kept being something new to be glued to. You know, first there was the the news that, you know, came out of the initial attack and, and that there kept being new information from that for a while. And then there was the anthrax thing. You know, there just kind of kept being something new that was keeping many, many people glued to their to their TVs or, you know, avidly reading the paper every day. I really almost never turned on the TV to watch the news. You know, maybe the first day when, when I came home from work, I probably turned on the TV for a little while. But I, I would spend so long every day just immersed in the guest book entries and the stories that, you know, reading about the individuals who died, which was I, I feel like that was harder for me than thinking about it as a large event, but thinking about one person, it would be kind of devastating and I would kind of do that every day. And then I didn't want to go home and turn on the TV and, and see the news some more. I, th I probably missed some important stuff because I just kind of refused to pay a lot of attention um, to the news beyond what I was receiving from doing my job. You know, it was, 
almost as if it sounds like you were participating in mourning each one of those 3,000 people one at a time. Every day for over a year, yes. 20 years later, are there any particular people's stories that still stick with you that you find you still think about? Well, first I will tell you that at the time, I probably, I, I, I wouldn't say that I would have been able to recite all of the names of the 3,000. I certainly couldn't have done that, but I knew every single name. You know, if a, if a name of someone who died that day came up in a different context, I knew it for what it was. Because, I, you know, I would look every day at the guestbook entries and, you know, checking for the new tributes that were available from the newspapers and so on. And this, I've lost some of that over the years. Probably I don't remember them all now, 20 years later, but it was, re- and I'm, I don't know if I speak for any of my coworkers, but I bet that I do. I bet that there were other people working with me at Legacy at that time who, who really knew all those names. But one that did stand out was a young man named Wells Crowther. And that's my last name. And it's not a really common last name. It's, I, I've never met someone named Crowther who wasn't my relative. So it, that's the, you know, it's not like my last name was Smith and there was another Smith. Um, it was shocking, in fact, to see that there was someone with my last name who had died. And so he, he really did stick with me. He was 24 and he worked in the World Trade Center. Basically, he gave his life helping other people get, get out. He, they know that he saved, you know, at, uh, at least 15 or 16 people, I think, by, you know, refusing to just get himself out before he could help some others make their way to safety. He had a, a red bandana on him that, that kind of became his, the symbol that's associated with him because he, he put it, uh, you know, over his face, like, like we would wear a mask today to, to protect himself from, you know, all of the smoke and debris and dust that was in the air. And so people just kept seeing the, you know, this guy with a red bandana going back and forth, helping people to safety and then going back to get more. There were so many stories like that where individuals had this moment where they made the choice to put other people first and go back and help. And some of those people didn't make it. And when I think about the grief associated with this event, I think of that emotional impact of just sort of feeling what it must have been like to make those sort of choices in the moment. There's another one of those helpers, another one of the names that has stuck with me, and even more so in recent years, this one. And his name was Franco Lalama. And the reason that I say even more in recent years is because um, I think five years ago, I interviewed his daughter, Katie Lalama, who was seven years old the day her dad died. And she has grown up to become a young woman who loves to help people, uh, has, has done work with other people who are grieving and, and works in the at least when I when I spoke to her, she was working in nonprofits to help others. And her dad helped some people out of the World Trade Center after the attack where he worked and was last seen. He was, he was on his way down the stairs and, and was last seen going back up to make sure everybody from his office got out. What was the nature of the conversation you had with his daughter, Katie, years after the fact? I talked to her about a uh, comfort zone camp, um, which which is a camp for grieving children that she had attended, uh, you know, not long after her, her dad's death. Comfort zone was, was pretty new not long before 9-11 happened. And after 9-11, they, the, you know, the folks in charge of comfort zone realized, and they were out on the East Coast, and they realized we, we need to help the children of you know people who who died uh, in the attack. This is this could be our mission, and so they I think they did a special a special camp for for those children. And Katie, maybe at age eight or nine, was able to attend it. And it's just a weekend, and they they just really focus on you know they they partner each kid 
with an, a, an adult buddy. You know, each one has this one-on-one um, partner that they talk to and who can kind of help them with various ways that they can work through their grief. And they do one-on-one stuff with their buddy and then they do group exercises together. And some of it is, you know, really obvious, like we are working on grief. And then some of it is more fun camp stuff that you would do, but building confidence, like in, uh, you know, an obstacle course, having a bonfire where then they spend some time talking about their person that they lost. Katie kept going back to this camp year after year, having had a really good experience with it in her first year. And when I talked to her, she was also um, being one of those big buddies to, to younger grieving children now uh, and and just keeps doing it as often as she can. You know, now that, now that she's a grown up and has a, a job and has a life, but she still wants to make these these comfort zone camp weekends a, a part of her life, helping helping other kids in the way that someone helped her when she needed it so badly. The togetherness really makes a difference, doesn't it? The ability to grieve not just alone, but with people and offer one another support in a, in a situation like this. I think that's a hard thing. I think that there are people who say or might think, I just need to be alone. Nobody, nobody wants to talk to me when I'm grieving. It's, you know, I'm no fun. But then, yeah, I think as soon as you are, let yourself accept the, the, the help and companionship that someone else might want to give you, you can, if you, if you, if you let yourself, you can see how much that is really helpful. Yeah. It reminds me of the day I had, um, the day after September 11th, while you were at legacy setting up all these thousands of online memorials where people could come and mourn. I was working as a local newspaper editor in Pittsburgh, which was the closest big city to where flight 93 went down. So even though it it wasn't like the experience of being in New York or Washington at that time, it was still close to people grieving. And so I, I was working, trying to publish stories that would certainly help people make sense of what was going on. Um, and part of that was helping them grieve. We were the paper in Pittsburgh that focused on covering events happening around town, um, cultural happenings and sports and music. The night of September 12th, a local nightclub, a place called Club Cafe in Pittsburgh, decided to hold a musical vigil. Um, I went over there and it was a small room and it just kept getting fuller and fuller and fuller as people who didn't want to be alone trickled in and sitting around with all those people the day after it happened. um, It was just tremendously powerful and comforting and no one wanted to leave. I remember that night going on and on and on and on because no one wanted it to stop. You know, they just, they didn't want to go back to not having everyone in a big group hug, basically. Mm -hmm. In the years that followed, eventually we saw the creation of the national September 11th Memorial and museum in New York, where the World Trade Center was. And of course, there's also the Flight 93 Memorial out in Pennsylvania. And there's a memorial at the Pentagon. So many people who were in New York came from elsewhere. And Mm -hmm. people's hometowns who died that day are all across the country and across the world. It wasn't just American citizens who were killed that day. I know in some instances, people's hometowns have named public spaces after them. You know, this is something we see a lot in cities. You're walking down the street in your neighborhood and you see that there's a new street sign because a street has just been renamed in memory of someone. If we don't know that person, maybe we just take that in stride as a thing that happens in the city. But for the people who did know those who were lost and who are being memorialized like that, it's a very different kind of experience to walk through that space. Well, didn't we see something about that 
in uh, at least one of the guest book entries? We did. There was a September 11th guest book that 16 years after the fact, in 2017, a mourner left a condolence that said, I ride by Knoll's Way once or twice a week. I'm initially saddened, but then I remember his infectious smile and gentle demeanor, and I begin to smile myself. That was and is truly Knoll's Way, and he still has the ability to touch people and bring them together. What an amazing young man. He will forever be remembered by all that had the good fortune to have crossed paths with him. It's just such a different experience to encounter someone's memorial in the world when it's not impersonal. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, you know, one thing we see a lot of in the guest books is condolence notes from strangers who, as part of a visit to the World Trade Center site or another memorial or as part of a school assignment, if they're a student, someone who has ended up randomly taking hold of a memorial bracelet or a memorial token of some kind in one specific name from someone who died on September 11th. And I was really struck by how many of those people are moved to find the obituary for the person whose name they honored that day and leave a note in their obituary. I remember seeing a lot of that sort of guest book entry, um, especially when we were reviewing entries around and after the first anniversary of the attack. And, and, and I, I think we had an example of one of these entries as well, right? We did. Um, I saw one that was a good example on a legacy guest book that was left 10 years after the fact in 2011. This was in the obituary guest book for a firefighter, um, Peter Freund. And the note read, I would like you to know that my daughter, age nine, wore Peter's photo and engine number around her neck on a memorial stair climb our city organized on September 11th. It is the same photo that is on this memorial site. We live in Wausau, Wisconsin, and the fire department organized a climb up our tallest building. She climbed, and after she came down, rang a bell and announced who she climbed in memory of. I would just like to let you know that Peter was remembered here. It's almost part of the morning ritual, isn't it? Coming online to tell the story of their own remembrance mm -hmm. as part of the act of preserving this person's memory. Yeah. And there's another facet to that too, which is people who, who did have a personal connection to the deceased, whether that was that they knew them or that they were a couple degrees of separation from them. But those people also came back to the guest books 10 or more years later to talk about that personal connection, right? And there are some of those people who have been born, grown up, lived entire lives since the tragedy happened. And they're still getting pulled back to keep expressing more thoughts and feelings for the people who died that day. I noticed one guest book um, for a New York police department officer, Robert Fazio Jr., that had a note left um, 10 years later in September 2011 that said, thank you for saving my husband on that day. You pulled him from the concourse, got him out, and put him into an ambulance before you ran back in to save more lives. I didn't even know him then, but your selflessness and extreme courage is to this day changing the course of lives. Please know that the man you saved is doing great things as a foster parent to children in need. He is a wonderful father to these children. Your legacy lives on in him and in them and in everything they and their children and their children's children will do. They will know about you. You will never, ever be forgotten. You know, that particular note is an example of something that, that we often see in guest books and that, that we see a lot 
in the September 11th guest books. And, and that is people talking directly to the deceased. Mm-hmm. It's not a condolence. It's not saying, I am so sorry for your loss, which of course is something that we also see a lot in guest books. That's that's what we envisioned, I think, when we first created the guest book was that people would say, I'm so sorry for your loss. But what we see so, so often is people using the guest book as a way to speak directly to someone that they can't speak directly to really. And they write these really touching notes, whether it's this sort of thing, I never met you, but you mean this much to my life. Or if it's someone who who did know and love the person who died and, and is just using this forum as a way to feel like they they are still communicating with them. That's really one of the most profound truths that we that we learn looking at legacy every day. Our experience of our relationship with someone we love changes when they die, certainly, but it continues to bring us new feelings and thoughts and ideas and inspirations. Our loved one is gone, but they're still very much present in all those places where that person's life remains visible. Even if that place is an online memorial, we often, I think, find ourselves moved to speak with them. Yeah, and we have especially found that on legacy to be true for people's spouses and and their children. And, you know, so many children, uh, like Katie LaLama, who I I mentioned a little while back, so many children lost parents on September 11th. I saw one of those families um, in a legacy guest book entry that read, Dear Daddy, It's been almost nine years since you passed away. While I once was your little girl, I'm almost all grown up today. I'd give anything to have you still with us. Even though you're not here, you influenced me in so many ways. While I've never really looked at the websites before, it's nice to see how you influenced other people and are missed by not only me. I love you, Daddy, and I hope you're looking down and are proud. This is definitely by far, you know, not the only one of these entries where someone who was a young child on September 11th is finding a way to try to speak to their parent sort of for the first time on the record. Not only speak to him, but, you know, she she really expressly said that she was learning more about him by looking at that guest book. She, she saw how he was able to influence other people and how other people miss him. Right. She's, so, you know, something that she, she couldn't have gotten about, about her dad without this guest book. Right. You know, another phenomenon that we saw in these September 11th guest books, especially in, in the early days, this was really frequent. There were people who, people who made it their personal project to sign every single one of those almost 3,000 guest books. And it took a long time. You know, maybe someone would do five of these a day. And we would get to know these people. We would get to recognize their name as we were reviewing those entries. And sometimes they just said the exact same thing on every one. And it was just kind of their way of saying, I was here. I remembered you. Some people would personalize it a little bit or a lot. And you knew for sure that those people were, were reading the tributes uh, that were posted by the New York Times and the other papers as well as maybe the other guest book entries from people who knew them because they could pull out a personal detail that struck them from that person's life story and include that in, in the guest book. But I always liked to think that even the people who just, you know, said the same thing on every entry, just to mark their, their presence there. I always like to think that they took their opportunity to read the person's story and learn about them too. And then, you know, completed that by, signing the guest book. That was the end of the ritual was signing it to say, I was here and I remember you. And then, you know, moved on to the next one or took a break until the next day. We don't see that so much in, uh, you know, the day-to-day obituaries that we, that we publish now, but that was such a big thing then. The other thing that we've seen in terms of people who were so impacted by 
September 11th, who were not among those who died that day, are the obituaries that have come along over the past 20 years for people who had their lives changed in such a profound way by September 11th that um, it became a central fact of their life that was noted when they died. And we've seen that in a bunch of different ways, but I, I seem to remember that you had noted one um, a few years ago uh, that talked about the example of someone who changed their life work as a result to what happened that day. Yeah, this was in an obituary for uh, Daniel Bryce Adams. And it says, Dan was a security system service technician for Safe Systems Incorporated for eight years. After 9-11, Dan felt the need to contribute to his community. He graduated from the Firefighters Academy and became a volunteer firefighter and first responder with the Indian Hills Fire Department. It seems like there were any number of people who who really took that message from from Fred Rogers after September 11th to heart when something awful happens in the world. It's the helpers who get us through it. One of those actually was was really prominent. And I think a lot of people would will know his name, uh, Pat Tillman, who was an NFL player and not long after the attack left the NFL uh, to join the military. And he he then died in, I believe it was a friendly fire incident some years later. There was one thing I just discovered the other day while I was reading through some of these obituaries and doing some general research for this discussion today. You know, I went back to my own files and I pulled out the first issue of my newspaper in Pittsburgh that published after September 11th. And it was full of a bunch of different stories, um, covering different angles and talking to all different people. And one of them was a personal piece that was directly about the experience of living through the grief that week. And this was by a wonderful Pittsburgh writer uh, named Jude Vachon. And when I saw it, I immediately remembered having having read this when we published it 20 years earlier, because there, there was one passage in particular that had stuck with me. And I'm going to quote it. She wrote, anyone who's paying any attention knows they have a big hole in them now. I picked up a black rock with a hole in it on Tuesday. I pulled out my label maker and I punched in 9-11-2001 on blue label maker tape, and I taped it onto the rock with the hole in it. Question, what's black and blue with a big hole in it? Answer, my rock and humankind. It's just, it's such a simple little image, such a simple mm -hmm. little moment of a thing that happened, but that image really resonated at the time. Mm -hmm. And I came across this in the newspaper just last week, and read it and in a truly unexpected coincidence i opened up facebook the next day and a mutual friend from pittsburgh was announcing with sorrow that that jude that writer had had just died herself um, oh man and it was just a reminder that all of our lives are a big circle you know, we're, we're all so woven together in time and place and relationships and these moments of death and life through them really are the things that bring us together. Well, you know, one thing that you can always do at these times is, uh, to, to donate in the person's memory. It's, it's what I always do when someone I love or someone who a friend loves uh, has died is, you know, what was their cause? What did they, how did they want to, to be remembered um, to, with, to, with charitable giving? It's, it's, a, it's a big deal. It's important. And we can do that now at the 20th anniversary of the September 11th attack. You know, it feels like a good time to, to think about 
maybe a, a, a cause that grew out of that day or that is still helping people uh, who are affected by that day. And I actually, I actually did think of one of those that I wanted to donate to for the 20th anniversary. Going back to the beginning when I was talking about my fellow Crowther, Wells Crowther, who died that day, his family really very shortly after his death established the Wells Remy Crowther Charitable Trust that does a lot to help young people um, with scholarships and, and, and other activities. So I'm donating there this year in, in memory of my fellow Crowther. How about you? I am also going to circle back to something you said earlier about the wonderful organization Comfort Zone Camp, mm -hmm. which provides services um, in various locations around the country to help children who are grieving work through the process and begin to heal. I am going to personally donate along with Legacy.com to Comfort Zone Camp in honor of the 20th anniversary of September 11th this year. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. It's such a good organization. I'm, I'm glad they're still out there doing what they do. On that note, that is our show for today. Thank you to Legacy.com, where this month you'll find all our September 11th memorials and tributes linked from our homepage. Just go to Legacy.com. Also on Legacy, you can now honor a loved one's memory by planting memorial trees in their name. Just visit Legacy.com slash trees. To hear more life stories, like some of those we talked about today, you can subscribe to Immortalized on your favorite podcast app. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just look up Legacy.com on YouTube. And if you're on Facebook, you can follow Legacy.com there for daily updates. Thanks for listening.